Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this Organic Chemistry Lab video covers a Wittig reaction experiment. This is part 3, Recrystallization and Melting Point. In the previous video in the series, I described a Wittig reaction between benzyl triphenyl phosphonium chloride and 9-anthraldehyde with sodium hydroxide base. That produced the two products shown here, triphenyl phosphine oxide on the top and trans 9 styrol anthracene on the bottom. In this video, I'll describe recrystallization to separate the alkene product from the triphenyl phosphine oxide and then describe melting point analysis of that alkene. I'll be using isopropyl alcohol to recrystallize the product today. This solvent is a good choice for recrystallizing the alkene product because it's a very good solvent when it's hot, but a poor solvent when it's cold. It also does a better job of dissolving the triphenyl phosphine oxide product than the alkene product. These properties make it a great recrystallization solvent. To start things off, I put some isopropyl alcohol in an Erlenmeyer flask and I put that on the hot plate with a stick to help smooth out the boiling. Now I'll take the crude product in the beaker and add a stir bar to it and then add some amount of this boiling isopropyl alcohol. I'm adding a few milliliters here so that when I put the beaker on the hot plate it won't overheat. It'll just go to the temperature of the boiling solvent. I'll need to add more though to get it to dissolve. So I'm adding the boiling isopropyl alcohol here, one pipette full at a time or so, and I'm watching to see if the product dissolves. If it doesn't dissolve, I'll add another squirt, and I'll keep doing this until I add enough boiling isopropyl alcohol to just make the solid dissolve. While I'm adding isopropyl alcohol, I'm also losing some out of the beaker due to evaporation. If you add isopropyl alcohol too slowly, the beaker could actually dry out and the product could char. So you have to make sure you add it fast enough that the volume in the beaker is actually going up. Then you want to stop at the point where it's fully dissolved. I'm at that point now, so I'll take the beaker off and set it on the bench to cool. I'm going to pluck the stir bar out now with a magnetic stir bar retriever, which is really just a magnet embedded in a plastic stick. As the solution cools, we'll start to see crystals. You can see a few sparkly flakes forming here, which will spread and grow. I'll give you another view of the flask from a different angle so you can see them a little bit better. Now I'm showing the process from an overhead view where you can see that the crystals have grown and expanded. When one crystal forms, it acts as a seed for other crystals to form, and the process continues on its own. Crystals will continue to grow until the solution is no longer saturated with the product. The hope here is also that the triphenylphosphine oxide will stay dissolved in solution and not crystallize out. This is exactly what happens, because triphenylphosphine oxide is a polar molecule and isopropyl alcohol is a polar solvent, they're a good solubility match. The alkene product is much less polar and therefore doesn't dissolve nearly as well in the isopropyl alcohol solvent. And that's a good thing, because it allows crystals to form. Here's what the flask looks like at the end of the process. Now I'll vacuum filter the crystals. I'll turn the water aspirator on and get a piece of filter paper and put it in the Buchner funnel. Then I'll wet that paper down using a little bit of isopropyl alcohol to seat the filter paper against the holes in the Buchner funnel. Now I'll pour the crystals into the Buchner funnel using a spatula to help me transfer them. When I'm done with this transfer, I can rinse that beaker with a little bit of isopropyl alcohol to help transfer the crystals more completely into the Buchner funnel. The crystals of alkene are still wet with isopropyl alcohol at this point, and they need to be dry before we take their mass or determine their melting point. If we take a melting point on a wet solid, the solvent will function as an impurity and depress the melting point. It's a good idea to let the vacuum pull over your crystals for at least 15 minutes before you attempt to take the melting point, or better yet, dry in your drawer for a week until the next lab period, if possible. Now I'll get the mass of the alkene product. I'll put a plastic weigh boat on the balance, tear it out, scrape my crystals into the weigh boat, and then measure their mass. Finally, I'll prepare a sample for melting point analysis by crushing some of the crystals to make it easier to pack them into the melting point capillary. Here I'm using a spatula to crush the crystals into a powder. Next, I'm taking a melting point capillary tube and pushing the open end into the powder that I just made to get the powder to go into the tube. Then I'll turn the tube over and bounce it on the bench to get the solid to move down into the closed end of the tube. To help with the packing, I'll bounce the capillary through this long glass tube a couple of times. And now the sample is ready for melting point analysis. Here I'm carrying out melting point analysis of the sample. The key thing with melting point is to approach it slowly. Ideally the temperature should be rising at a rate of 1 to 2 degrees per minute as you approach the melting point. 
Remember also that you should report a range. Report the temperature that the solid first starts to melt at, where you see the first drop of liquid, and then also report the temperature where the last bit of solid becomes a liquid. That range represents the melting point. Watch the rest of this video and look for those two temperatures. When the sample melts, that'll be the end of this video series on the Wittig reaction to form trans 9 styrol anthracene. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video, and consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.